But we have some pivotal events. And they are establishing, have established, a global community and a global economy of the kind we have never, ever had before. Now, the first pivotal event didn't, wasn't a single event. It was a series, but it grew out of a single idea. And we don't know who it was. But somewhere, someone realized that a vacuum tube that you used in radios could be either on or off. That's a very fundamental thing to realize. You're saying, what? Well, of course, of course it could be on or off. But it suddenly occurred to someone that by being either on or off, the vacuum tube could represent either a zero or a one. And then when the transistor was invented out of the Bell Labs, the switch in the transistor, which is much, much smaller than a vacuum tube, could be on or off. And now, all of a sudden, you could take a bunch of transistors and put them together and wire them together so that you can have a series of combinations of zeros and ones. And a new language was created to read that combination of zeros and ones called digital code. And huge rooms, as big or bigger than this one, were devoted to machines crammed full, first with vacuum tubes and then crammed full with transistors that were arranged and manipulated to be the either on or off. And these machines were called computers. And they could read digital code. And they could speak digital code, which meant they could talk to each other. And thus, the information age was born. And at the dawn of the information age, a man named Moore compounded Moore's Law, which says every 18 months, the computing power will double. And the machines got smaller and smaller and more and more powerful. And I've had this demonstrated dramatically in my life at one point in my career, I held the exalted title, sounds even more important than being resident scholar at the Hinckley Institute of Politics, chairman of the board of the American Computer Corporation. We had about five employees and we were operating out of a garage, but we were building computers. And we were building, we were selling them as fast as we could build them. Now we had two products. One was a floppy disk computer that was about the size of a small suitcase. You slip in two floppy disks, dual floppy disks, and it would do computing. And then we had, that we sat sold for $5,000 in the 1970s, when $5,000 was a lot of money. Then we had a hard disk 10 megabyte machine. It was as big as a washing machine. 10 megabytes, five fixed and five removable, that sold for $35,000. And we sold every one of those we could build. And people said, you're crazy. You're in the computer business competing with IBM? We said, no, IBM knows, understands these mainframes these big computers that fill buildings. But here's a computer the size of a washing machine that can take over your local accounting office and do all of your accounting for you. Wow, for only $35,000? Yeah, wow. And we said with great confidence, IBM will never be in this business. And of course, when IBM produced the personal computer, the American Computer Corporation disappeared, and I had to find another job. Well, today you're carrying, how many of you? Let's, okay, reach in. Hold it, you're supposed to have turned it off, but you have it with you. How many of you have 
a smartphone, a Blackberry, whatever it might be, there's more computing power on this device than they had in those rooms full of computers at the dawning of the information age. This one that we had to pay something like seven, eight hundred dollars for, and I plugged it in to synchronize it to my Mac Air, and got the error message that said we cannot synchronize your iPhone because the software is obsolete. <laughs> obsolete? I just bought it. <laughs> well, not in computer terms. I bought it a year, uh, a year and a half ago, so it's now obsolete. We can throw it away. The information age is changing everything. And it's doing it at absolutely blinding speed. The difference between the Industrial Revolution that you all studied about in school, that changed everything, and the Information Revolution that you are living through, is that the information revolution is coming at us ten times faster than the Industrial Revolution did. And Moore's Law is still happening. Every 18 months, computer power doubles. All right, that's the first huge river, if I can use that, that simile for you, of change that's occurring in our lives. And, and the standard statement is, if you can't understand the electronic device you carry around with you, get your grandchildren to explain it to you. And of course they can and they do. They are living in that world. And we go back to the charts that uh, Lieutenant Governor Bell put up for us. If you are computer illiterate, you are in as much trouble in this world as if you were English illiterate, as if you could not read or write, if you cannot handle the challenges. And there is a term for that that we talk about at the national level, the digital divide between the poor and the middle class as the digital divide of people who cannot handle digital code in any way and cannot understand this. And that's another reason why the educational component of what we're going to into is so important. Um, one of the things I'm doing, I'm co-chair of a foundation funded by Bill Gates that is determined to bring vaccinations into the poor countries of the world. And in that role I was in Mozambique where we vaccinated 3.6 million children against measles in a five-day period. And that was quite an amazing logistical accomplishment. Mozambique is one of the three poorest countries in the world. And I won't talk about all of it, but I said, how did you do it? How did you get the word to all of these parents to come bring their children to over 300 different locations in Mozambique to get these vaccinations. And they said, cell phones and bullhorns. <laughs> there were enough people, even in this poor country, walking around with cell phones that the government had some way of text messaging everybody and saying, bring your children. And then out in the bush where people didn't have cell phones, they went around with bullhorns, shouting into the bush, come to such and such a place on such and such a time. And we drove to one of these things. I didn't think we would ever see anything other than grass high enough with the, the road was just wide enough for the vehicle so that we, we didn't dare turn to the right or left. When an animal would cross the road, we had to stop and let it happen because there was no way to swerve around. And suddenly there was a clearing and in the clearing there was a tree and under the tree there was a table set across, a, a, board really set across some sawhorses and behind it there were some medical workers with some vaccine and lined up were about 18 to 20 women carrying their babies to get them vaccinated against measles and we were there for maybe half an hour and we left 
There were about 18 women standing there. They came at just about the same pace with which they left. There was never a time when there wasn't somebody standing in line. How did you get the word out to get the people to go to the tree wherever it was? Cell phones and bullhorns. And that illustrates the world in which we're coming. If you don't have cell phones, if you don't have these devices, if you don't understand the impact that this is making on the world, not just Cedar City, you don't understand this great river in which you're, in your, which you're